Hello, everyone, and warm welcome to another ANG Neuro webinar. We are happy to be hosting today's session on, um, on ultrasonic neuromodulation, a new tool for brain mapping and therapeutic interventions. Our presenter today is Dr. Jai Sanguinetti, who is an adjunct professor at the University of Arizona and a research assistant professor at the University of New Mexico. He has published widely from topics on the neural basis of vision and the temporal dynamics of perception to understanding how the brain changes in Parkinson's disease and schizophrenia. His current interests include using non-invasive brain stimulation to enhance cognition and well-being. Dr. Sanguinetti and Shinzen Young recently launched the Sonication Enhanced Mindfulness Awareness SEMA lab at the University of Arizona. Their lab is developing accelerated mindfulness protocols for therapeutic interventions to treat addiction, chronic pain, and depression. After his presentation, he will also show us a quick demo of how ultrasound and neural navigation work together. There will be a short Q&A session afterwards and some poll questions um, which we will appreciate if you uh, actively participate in. So Jai, thanks a lot for accepting our invitation. Uh, we are looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much to Ant Nero for the invitation to be here today. Um, and thanks for everybody out there on the internet for joining. I hope everyone is safe uh, and healthy. Um, and I'm really excited today to talk to you about um, ultrasonic neuromodulation. So this is using ultrasound to modulate the nervous system and specifically the brain. And I want to talk a little bit about our research here at the University of Arizona, where we're using this new tool to both probe the nervous system to try to understand mood, as well as trying to use this as an intervention for mood disorders. And then finally, if there's some time at the end, I'd like to talk about our most recent research where we're trying to use this tool to accelerate uh, mindfulness or meditation training. And let's see if I can advance my slides. There we go. Um, so most of the work today is done at the Center for Consciousness Studies at the University of Arizona. That's where I'm the, the assistant director. Um, and we also run one of the largest consciousness conferences in the world. So I'll put a little plug for that. We have a conference coming up next month, <clears throat> which is completely online. Um, and some of the work is done at the University of New Mexico. Um, and I have no financial disclosures. It, it says none there, it's hard to see. So um, what we'll talk about today first is a bit about ultrasonic neuromodulation um, as a useful tool for brain mapping or perturbing the nervous system to try to understand its function. Then I want to talk about uh, using this tool to enhance mood, um, both for basic um, people without any mood disorders, as well as translating to depression, and how we've used this tool to actually modulate functional connectivity in networks that relate to mood. Um, and then finally, I want to talk about our most recent work where we're accelerating mindfulness training with this technology. So uh, there are a number of ways to perturb or alter the nervous system for a temporary amount of time. And each of these ways is helpful for understanding how the brain functions. So my PhD work was on visual neuroscience. We were looking at using um, visual sensory information to perturb the visual system. And then we can look at how the visual system and behavior respond. Uh, of course, you can use um, molecular and chemical interventions like pharmaceutical interventions to change the brain. And what I've been most interested in the last five years or so is actually using both invasive and non-invasive brain stimulation methods to perturb the nervous system. So uh, invasive methods obviously mean that you're drilling a hole uh, or doing a neurosurgery to put an electrode in the brain. Obviously, that's a powerful method for altering brain function, uh, but it's not very viable in the lab because most of our subjects don't want to have an invasive brain surgery. So what's occurred over the last 20 to 25 years is researchers and uh, the medical community have been looking hard for ways to alter brain function directly, um, but with non-invasive methods. So typically we're using electricity or magnetism uh, because that really is the language of the brain. 
Um, but what I'll tell you today is you can actually use ultrasound in a non-invasive and safe way to alter brain function. And really what's important about brain perturbation is it helps us to understand brain function. We can directly causally alter the brain with invasive and non-invasive methods, and we can see how the brain and behavior and also self-report or phenomenology responds to that. And then of course, once we understand how the brain functions, then we can begin to develop interventions to try to treat everything from neurological disorders like Parkinson's disease, all the way up to uh, psychological issues like depression or addiction. Now, uh, most of you are probably aware that the most popular non-invasive brain stimulation or neuromodulation methods are transcranial direct current stimulation, which uses weak current, uh, direct current. You can also use alternating current called TACS, um, or transcranial magnetic stimulation, which uses a very strong magnet to induce an electric field in the brain. And TMS, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, was actually approved by the FDA in the United States uh, back in 2008, I believe, for the treatment of depression. So uh, several weeks of this treatment, a couple times, um, up to five times a week, over the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex can actually significantly reduce the symptoms of depression. Now, TGCS, or direct current, has been one of the most popular methods for brain stimulation. Uh, you can watch people on YouTube who are making these devices and stimulating or supposedly stimulating themselves at home. So it's not just scientists who have been interested in this, the medical doctors, but also the general community and public. Um, now, the limitation for both magnetic and electrical stimulation is really focality, so trying to get the energy at one location. Of course, you have 100 billion neurons and even a square centimeter or a square millimeter uh, of brain area is millions and perhaps uh, billions of neurons, depending on how big the area is. And so uh, both TMS and TDCS have an issue that they can't really focal focally stimulate. Um, and especially TDCS can't go very deep. You can't penetrate very deep into the brain. And so really you're talking about modulating just the outer layer of the neocortex. Now I wanted to ask um, how many of you have actually had any experience with TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation or TMS? Maybe we can put up the uh, poll. There it is. Yeah, the poll is um, ongoing and we can give it 30 seconds or so. Okay, great. Here are the results. So 40%, around 40% we used DDCS or TMS in the lab. 41% uh, none, 11% um, two and three, and yeah, the rest tested them uh, on themselves at home, mainly TDCS. Okay, that's, that's great. That's a pretty high percentage. So um, almost half of you out there are using this in the lab and uh, that, that's commiserate with what we're seeing in the United States as well. There's uh, quite an interest in using these methods. Um, and now, as most of you know who are using it, then both TMS and TDCS, um, especially TDCS, has had a bit of a replication problem uh, recently. And it's been uh, sort of questioned whether TD, you know, how strong the effects of TDCS are. Um, specifically, and I think that's partly because of the explosion of the studies, the sort of lack of quality in some of those studies, um, and really a lack of the sort of focality of being able to target specific brain regions across different studies. And so um, in the ultrasound field, we've been very aware of some of those issues with methodology, and we've been really trying hard both not to overhype ultrasound. Um, you know, I think in the beginning with TDCS, there was a bit of a hype train, especially in the media about TDCS. Um, and, and also being aware of some of the limitations up front of the technology, 
so the science can be a little bit better done at the beginning. And I think that's beginning to happen in TDCS now that there's a, an awareness of this issue. And I'm sure most of the people out in the audience who are using it are, are aware of these issues and trying to um, rectify them in their lab. So um, what we'll talk about today actually is using low intensity ultrasound as another method to modulate brain function. Now, when you think about ultrasound, uh, what's interesting about the technology in general is that this is a highly developed technology. It's a very fast growing industry. Um, they're beginning to put ultrasound devices in cell phones, for example, uh, for facial recognition. And we have a, a, a very long history, over 80 years, of using both low intensity ultrasound for imaging and high intensity ultrasound for uh, ablation or destroying tissue around the body. And actually, there's a company in Israel that makes a very high tech um, device that can um, focus a couple thousand ultrasound transducers deep into the brain to do essentially surgery to ablate cancer tissue in the brain. And so this is a highly advanced technology. You can, you can actually ablate tissue with millimeter precision all the way down to the thalamus. Um, and we have a good sense of what the safety limits are, how high energy you can go before you start damaging and what the low intensity range is for safety. And so the idea is if you could use this technology with low intensity ultrasound to modulate the brain, you would have access to a highly developed technology uh, that can focus ultrasound into the brain um, to relatively anywhere in the brain. Now, having said that, I wanted to give another poll. Um, let's see, there we go. Uh, to see up front, before I tell you all about uh, focused ultrasound, how many of you actually are confident right now that ultrasound can modulate the brain? So I'll give you this poll now, and then I'll tell you a bunch of information about ultrasound, and I'll give it to you again. Okay, more than 70% participated, and uh, they say, I mean, the majority is uh, between 50% to 75%. That's 43% uh, of the votes, and then between 17% to 99%, so they're quite optimistic. Yeah, I would say, I, I was expecting you mostly to be there at 25 to 50 or less. Uh, that's where most people start. But I think that actually um, speaks to where the field is. If I would have given you this question about five years ago, I think most of you who are scientists out there in the field uh, would have put less than 25% maybe, uh, because most people thought, well, how could mechanical energy influence the nervous system? It's really hard to wrap your head around that. Uh, but now ultrasound has grown to the point <clears throat> where most of you have probably heard about it as a neuromodulation technology. And I think now um, it's becoming more accepted. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the effects that have been out there. Uh, now, in my title, I call it ultrasound neuromodulation a new technology. It's actually a very old technique uh, going back to the 1920s. And um, I'll give you one example from the older literature. This is my favorite researcher, William Fry, in the field. Um, and he was at, I believe, the University of um, Illinois. And he did all kinds of fascinating studies from the 1940s on until the 1970s, 1980s. And this one, he's actually focusing an ultrasound transducer to the lateral geniculate nucleus, uh, the, the thalamic relay for the visual input, and attempting to alter its function. So he's got an EEG that's recording essentially visual activity, and he's flashing a light. And if you record with that EEG, you're recording a visual evoked potential, which is what you see here. Now, um, I believe it was just a couple of minutes of continuous wave ultrasound bathing the LGN. So this was not focused ultrasound, you just opened the beam, led to an immediate reduction in the visual evoked potential. And importantly, that visual evoked potential comes back to baseline after about 30 minutes. Now, this is actually much higher intensity than what we use today. 
But even with high intensity, he showed that you could reduce the visual evoke potential and uh, it appears there's no damage and it goes back to baseline. Now, from the 1920s to the 1990s, there's, you know, uh, in the teens to maybe 30 papers that came out showing that ultrasound can modulate specifically peripheral activation. Um, so somatosensory touch, um, as well as spinal input. And then in the 1950s, it began to be clear that you could actually modulate brain function as well. Um, then in uh, the early 2000s, researchers, uh, Jamie Tyler and others at ASU, uh, Arizona State University, began to show that not only could you modulate neural activity, you could actually evoke, um, you could it evoke neurons to fire. So here's an ultrasound pulse. Uh, we're recording neurons in a dish here, and you can see that you can actually cause spike trains. And then in the video, if you can see this, um, there we go. So these are calcium stained neurons. So when the neurons fire, you get a sort of burst of calcium and, and that's actually being stained. So you could see that. And what you see is one pulse of ultrasound right there. And then you see a spreading wave of activation. So the, the ultrasound is actually focused at this point uh, right here. And then you can actually see that those neurons are firing and then going back to their baseline firing rate. So when Dr. Tyler started publishing these studies, this sort of reactivated the field. People started getting really interested in focused ultrasound as a method for brain modulation. Um, then around the same time, Sunchik Yu at Harvard started publishing studies in rats and rabbits, showing that you could focus a beam of ultrasound down into either the somatosensory cortex or the, the motor cortex of these animals. So what you're seeing here in the slide is a focused ultrasound transducer that's focusing the beam down to be selective enough to target just um, different representational areas on the motor cortex. And these animals are in the MRI scanner, so they're getting functional brain scans. And what's really neat about this is you can do focused ultrasound in the scanner and you get very little image distortion um, because it's mechanical energy. And what you see is the motor cortex activation. So they're actually causing bold activation. When you look at the uh, actual paw movements, you can get individual paws to move. So that's very specific and highly focal. And then importantly, when you do histology and you look at to make sure that at these low intensities that they are using, that you're not causing any kind of brain damage, micro hemorrhages, or any kind of brain bleed. Um, and as we expect at low intensities, so below a watt per centimeter square, um, if you're measuring over time, uh, you don't see any type of damage in the brain, um, which is what we would expect. They use focused ultrasound, uh, or at least unfocused ultrasound for brain imaging um, in hospitals, and then they use the same types of intensities. So we wouldn't expect any damage. Now, when you start thinking about brain mapping, which is what I wrote in my title, what's really nice about focused ultrasound is it can be focused to millimeter precision. So this is another study at a Sunshik Hughes lab at Harvard, and they're mapping S1 and S2 in the somatosensory cortex with two different transducers. So this is a human study, um, and you can see how focal these ultrasound transducers are. Now you have to use um, MRI, structural MRIs, to guide the stimulation because of how focal it is. And so that's both an advantage and almost a disadvantage because it's quite expensive at the moment to do this, te this technique. Um, ideally, what you'd want to do is have the ultrasound imaging, which is possible, uh, so you can have the ultrasound guide itself to the area. But part of the problem there is it's hard to image through the skull, and so that's a problem that's being worked on. But what you can see here is the S1 transducer um, actually cause felt sensation in these subjects. So they're reporting what they feel, and they either felt pressure or heat in their hands with S1. And then at S2, they actually felt pressure on their fingertips and at later points in their hand. And so now you're starting to map the somatosensory representation in S1 and S2 relative to perception. I like to show this slide um, from Wen Ligon's lab uh, because it really shows how focal a single transducer, a single element transducer can be. So in this study, they're actually targeting the thalamus. It's one of the deepest structures that you can try to target in the brain. 
And with even a single transducer, what you can see is the beam is focused right on the thalamus. And when you look for the side view, um, you see it's actually highly focused with a sort of millimeter precision. And then um, we do have a little bit of an issue here on the, on the side view with what are called side lobes. So some of the energy sort of splits out and you might get some modulation in those areas. So that's one of the problems that's being worked on. Uh, but what he showed here is you can actually modulate some out of sensory evoked potential. So people are having their finger touched and you're recording EEG again over this amount of sensory evoked potential. And if you do a pulse of ultrasound right around the time when you touch the finger on each trial uh, relative to placebo then, or, or sham, then you actually see a reduction in the somatosensory evoked potential. So not only is ultrasound um, perturbing the system, but it's perturbing it in time and it within each trial. And so again, that's one of the big advantages here is you can pulse an, a, a, a single pulse of ultrasound with microsecond precision. Uh, so really faster than the brain fires in, in the first place. And I, I like to show this slide to compare the methods. So TDCS obviously spreads its activation across the neocortex. Um, in this image, you can actually see where the pad of TDCS would be. TMS is more focal, uh, but you know it's still spreading over multiple levels of the cortex. Transcranial focused ultrasound, what we've been talking about so far, is now a different magnitude scale. You're much, much more focal in theory. Now, this is sort of an ideal case um, because you have to worry about the skull and the ultrasound spreading through the skull. But at least in theory, if you've got a perfect ultrasound beam going through the skull, uh, this is the level of magnitude that you can get. This is a slide from Jamie Tyler's lab. And so, uh, as I said, here's the idealized case of focused ultrasound. Um, the actual case, if you're not doing any aberration correction, probably looks a little bit more like this or somewhere in between, um, depending on where you're stimulating on the skull. So uh, the, the skull is actually going to absorb, reflect, and refract uh, quite a bit of that ultrasound energy. And what you need to do, ideally, is take an individual subject's skull and correct the beam as it's going through that skull. And so this is a big problem. Uh, this is what I said. The field is trying to understand the limitations of the tech, and this is a major limitation. And so um, in most of the studies that are being published these days, you'll see the researchers actually modeling uh, how the beam looks as it's going through the skull. And I think in the next five years or so, what you'll see is the field will start figuring out how to correct the beam. So you can get more of this case in the first slide. Now, uh, you might be wondering, well, OK, how does mechanical energy influence the nervous system in the first place? Um, as you might expect, that's an open question. We don't quite understand how it works, and there's probably multiple interacting mechanisms in my view. Um, there is some evidence for radiation forces influencing the lipid bilayer through uh, different acoustic forces, like jetty forces, for example, or fluid dynamic forces that are actually causing membrane expansion and compression, which could change the excitability of the cell. Uh, there's also evidence for cavitation. So this is small micro bubbles that can form. Uh, stable cavitation is safe. You can get micro bubbles that move. Um, the dangerous situation is that those micro bubbles explode. That's called inertial cavitation. And that's actually used to open the blood brain barrier um, with intensities that are slightly above usually what we're using in the lab. But to open the blood brain barrier, you have to inject um, polymer or plastic micro bubbles into the blood and shake those bubbles. So without injection, typically you could get micro bubbles that may actually influence the lipid bilayer to change its excitability again. And there's been a proposal that heat might play a factor um, through some thermodynamic forces. Um, at the intensities that we're using, it's unlikely that much heating is happening and that's that's how we want it. We want it to be safe for the brain, and it's obviously dangerous if you're heating up tissue. Um, but small changes in uh, the baseline uh, thermoregulation of the cell might actually change its function as well. And then there's also biophysical mechanisms, of course. So ion channels are sensitive to stretching mechanisms. So they have a stretch sensitivity that's well-defined. 
and they may actually be uh, being influenced somehow by radiation sources or cavitation or other types of effects. So um, it's probably one or multiple of these types of mechanisms that are influencing the cell. And uh, because we don't quite understand the mechanism, the pulse parameter space is wide open and we don't quite understand which pulses lead both to inhibition or excitation or actually causing um, action potentials. But there is evidence that you can get all of those types of effects on the neurons with different pulse parameters. So um, now I wanted to switch a little bit to what we've done with this technology in the lab. And about seven years ago, we started turning our attention to mood disorders. So my PhD advisor, John J.B. Allen, um, is a specialist in treating and understanding depression. And we sort of started following the same track that TMS, magnetic stimulation, had followed such that we were trying to understand, can we modulate specific and focal brain regions that uh, are influenced in mood disorders? So disorders like depression, anxiety, or bipolar disorder. And what's nice about focused ultrasound, is, as I said, it's highly focused, and we can actually try to map which brain regions are involved in mood perception and mood disorders. And so unlike with TMS, uh, we decided to go for a different brain region other than the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, uh, which has been well defined in TMS as a treatment for depression. We decided to go for the right inferior frontal gyrus, and that's partly because it's easier to get ultrasound through the temporal window. So uh, the temporal window is right in front of the ears, and that's the thinnest spot uh, of, of the bone on the skull. And in our pilot testing, we found that people actually responded positively to right temporal stimulation, so right prefrontal temporal stimulation. Um, then when we started looking at the literature, it turns out that the right inferior frontal gyrus, which is involved in response inhibition, also seems to be involved in mood regulation and specifically in mood disorders. So in depression, anxiety, and um, bipolar disorder, uh, the right IFG shows up as dysregulated. And so we picked that as a target, both to try to modulate mood and to try to understand if we can modulate that brain area, do, does that actually relate to mood disorders? Uh, the design was pretty simple. So we recorded baseline self-reports and also uh, EKG to look at heart rate variability. We did some stimulation with um, ultrasound for 30 seconds, so very small dose. And then we uh, did the scales again in the um, EKG again, 15 and 30 minutes out. Now, the basic finding that we found across five studies is that in the placebo condition, um, you see basically no change in mood or a slight decrease in mood. It's a very boring study. Uh, we take people's cell phones away from them. These are typically undergraduates, and they sort of don't like to sit in a room by themselves and have their cell phones taken away. Uh, but the basic finding over four or five studies was that focused ultrasound, transcranial focused ultrasound, enhances mood. So going up on this scale, this is a visual analog mood scale, actually relates to people feeling better. And what we find is that actually the effect peaks at about 15 to 30 minutes, really 30 minutes after. And that's actually pretty surprising. We were expecting the effect to be immediate um, and then go back to baseline. And it occurs that quite the opposite was happening. They were feeling better towards the end of the study. Then, of course, we wanted to know, well, all right, self-report is an unreliable measure. What's actually happening in the brain? So we did a small pilot study where we did pre and post resting state functional connectivity. And we actually asked, do we see a change in the network that we're targeting? So the right inferior frontal gyrus network, does it change after being ultrasounded? And in this study, we did the ultrasound outside of the scanner. Now, uh, this is a very busy plot, but basically what we're looking at is the right IFG target, and then all the brain regions that are connected, uh, correlated, or anti-correlated in blue. Correlations are in uh, hot colors. And the basic finding is that after two minutes of ultrasound to the right IFG, now we see massive anti-correlations with brain regions that are involved in mood regulation and emotion regulation, um, as well as the default mode network, uh, which was very fascinating to us. The right IFG, back when we did the study, 
was not thought to be involved much in the default mode network, whereas now it's beginning to emerge that it might be part of the control system of that network. And so by perturbing the right inferior frontal gyrus, we enhanced mood, gave people better mood regulation, and we also decreased the default mode network activation, which also might be related to enhancing mood, um, or at least having your attention in the external environment, which might make you report a better mood. And like I said, uh, most researchers are now doing modeling work. So this is what our model looks like for our transducer. What you can see actually is that quite a bit of heat energy is at the skull. And so you do have to be careful about that. You don't want to heat up the skull. Some of that energy gets through the skull. And with our transducer, uh, our model was predicting that we were overshooting the target just a little bit here. But most of the energy was being deposited right into the right inferior frontal gyrus and then um, it sort of falls off pretty quickly as we move down. Now, of course, we ultimately wanted to apply this to depression. And so we ended up running a study over five days where subjects were getting focused ultrasound to the right IFG every day for five days. Uh, we were also taking EEG to look at frontal asymmetry, which is a marker, uh, biomarker of depression. And um, then we did the mood scales again. Now, since we were doing five days, which this was the first time that anybody had done multiple doses in the lab, um, we decided to turn the power down. We wanted to be as safe as possible. So we did about half the dose that we did in our fMRI study. Um, and I should mention that these patients or participants were, um, uh, they had depression-like symptoms. They were not clinically diagnosed as depressed but they were high on the Beck's depression inventory. And uh, what we found is that there was no change in depression scores, but there were significant changes in worry. Um, so trait worries significantly reduced to a big amount actually. And there was a decrease or an increase in global affect. So just like with our healthy controls, now our depressed subjects, even though depression wasn't decreasing, uh, they actually started feeling better over the five days. Now, the depression scores might not have changed because uh, we actually need to target the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which may be the case. Or it might be that our dose actually just wasn't strong enough. Uh, we might have needed to use a stronger dose and then done this over a longer amount of time. Now, with TMS studies, magnetic stimulation, typically the TMS is done over weeks. And typically, uh, you see a strong clinical effect after a week or two. Um, so it might be that we just got subclinical changes in depression that didn't show up. But this is at least encouraging. It's the first study where five days of ultrasound were done to the brain. Uh, there were no negative adverse effects. The, the participants uh, were fine. They didn't report any headaches or anything like that. And we did see a slight change, a positive change in their affect um, and worry. So that's really suggestive that this might actually be an effective treatment and that actually targeting the right inferior frontal gyrus may be a target for depression, uh, which is a, a relatively new finding. Okay, so with that, um, I wanted to ask again, maybe you, some of you have moved up to number four here. Uh, have you been more convinced by what I've said uh, about ultrasound modulating the brain? Okay, it seems the results significantly changed after your convincing explanation. So no one voted for the first option. And we have 60% for the last option, 75 to 99%. And 26% right. for the third one and the rest. Great. So it looks like I've had an effect on you. <laughs> um, yeah. Good. So I think you've seen enough evidence now that um, it seems likely that ultrasound is perturbing the brain. 
Um, but I would like to leave you with, uh, as you're reading these new studies, to be aware that uh, focusing the ultrasound through the skull is, is a very hard problem. Um, you know, so be, just like with TDCS, we can't assume at the moment that we're targeting only the brain region that we're talking about. So I told you I was targeting the right IFG, but I was probably targeting areas above and below that region as well. Um, and you should understand too, that once the ultrasound um, gets under the skull, all of the tissue, all of the different types of neurons, the cerebral spinal fluid and everything in between acts as water to the ultrasound. Ultrasound propagates through water with a known speed. And so even though the, the, the beam of sound can be focused, um, it actually continues to travel after that focus, probably bounces off the other end of the skull and comes back. Um, and so, you know, it, the, the energy deposition problem is still an issue um, that's being worked out. And really one way to solve that problem is to use multiple transducers. So of course the advantage here is that if I had a, a team of engineers, um, probably that worked at General Electric or somewhere like that, uh, who are ultrasound experts, I can build a helmet that has a million transducers that highly focuses a beam of ultrasound specific to that person's brain. Um, that's an engineering problem, uh, more than a scientific problem at this point. And so that, that type of device will be built at some point in the future. But at the moment, because we don't understand the pulse parameters and how much energy is needed really to modulate the brain with ultrasound, we're starting with one transducer. Uh, we're starting very simple just to try to track that problem. So just be aware of that. Um, so for, th for the final couple of minutes, I wanted to talk about uh, some of our research attempting to use focused ultrasound to enhance mindfulness. Um, so this is a project that's really, uh, really the focus of my lab at the University of Arizona. And that's because um, focused ultrasound uh, can reach targets in the brain that are deep and many of the uh, targets of mindfulness or meditation are deep targets and so you know tms and tdcs really can't reach some of those targets and it's been hard to accelerate uh, meditation training so i've been teaming up with shenzhen young who is a very well-known meditation teacher in the united states uh, and he's really outlined a paradigm for investigating mindfulness in the lab He's done a good job of trying to operationalize what mindfulness is, which is a very hard thing to define. Um, and he's just a very fun person to work with in the lab. So I'm really lucky to get to work with Shenzhen. And Shenzhen and I were looking at the meditation literature, which is growing exponentially, as you know. What we know is that it tends to have a lot of benefits, both on physical, mental, and cognitive health. And so in the lab, uh, mindfulness is a very useful intervention for a host of disorders, all the way from depression to uh, addiction, all the way down to things like chronic pain. So we know that mindfulness will work for these issues. Um, it's safe. Uh, there are some side effects, but they are much less serious than things like um, medical interventions, including things like pharmaceuticals. And so we wanna use mindfulness as an intervention. The problem is to get these effects on patients, it takes weeks or months um, or years in some cases. And so we started wondering, well, starting to learn about the brain side of mindfulness, uh, can we actually target some of those areas while people are undergoing mindfulness intervention to help the brain and help the person learn those mindfulness skills quicker? So that's the basic idea of the lab. We are talking about mindful awareness, so we define that loosely as a certain way of paying attention to your inner and outer field of experience. Um, now that's a very loose definition, but what we wanna do is we wanna go from the state changes. So when you're doing mindfulness, you're putting yourself in a state, and we wanna go to trait level changes. So you might have a trait of being reactive, um, here in the United States, politics is a very sort of triggering uh, issue for most of us. Um, and so you might go from hearing you know, a word like Donald Trump or Barack Obama as a very reactive word, um, and that might actually lead to maladaptive behaviors um, that you might see. And so mindfulness might help you to train, change that trait level behavior such that you can hear the word Donald Trump, and then you can be an effective uh, political activist. Uh, instead of burning down something, you can go out in the street and be effective um, with that anger. So that's what we mean from state to trait level change. 
Now, the way that we define mindfulness in the lab is by breaking it down into three core attention skills. I'm not gonna have time to really define these, but if you're interested after the talk, I can get into these. Um, but these are constructs that I can measure in the lab. And the idea is that all three of these traits, uh, all, all three of these skills working together lead to what we call mindful awareness. That ability to be present in the moment in a certain sort of, um, in a certain way where you're not getting to totally activated or triggered by the sensory input. Now, uh, we've decided to target several different brain networks, um, including the habit formation system, the basal ganglia, um, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is involved in sort of monitoring. But uh, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just talk about one area that we've been targeting recently, which is the default mode network. Now, most of you know what the default mode network is. It's a highly interconnected set of regions in the brain that activates when you're at rest. So I put you in the MRI scanner. I don't give you a task. Basically what happens for most people is they go into an inner mode where they think to themselves, they plan for the future. If you have depression, you'll start ruminating. Uh, you'll start thinking negatively. And that's all associated with this central activation of uh, midline brain regions that you see here. Now what's interesting about these brain networks is that in meditation, as you might expect, the, the central regions of the default mode network tend to deactivate. So they down-regulate as you're applying the meditation practice. Uh, so basically, these are different meditation styles, uh, focusing versus loving kindness. Uh, and here's control subjects who have been taught these. So these are meditators meditating for 30 years. These are control subjects just learning how to meditate. And what you see is that in the meditators, you significantly decrease medial prefrontal cortex and posterior cingulate activation. Um, now that's a pretty unified experience, uh, finding in the literature. We see this across many studies. And it's really becoming clear that the default mode network is a target of meditation practice. And so uh, what we wanted to ask is what if we actually modulate the default mode network while patients or participants are learning to meditate? Do we help them to gain the, benef the benefit, gain the effects of meditation quicker, uh, especially in the clinic? And then the long-term question is, does that help the brain learn those skills? Because it's not just about being in the state <clears throat> of mindfulness, but it's actually about uh, attempting to apply those skills, equanimity and concentration, in your daily life. If you have depression, for example, you need to notice when your mind is ruminating, bring your attention back to the present moment and try to disengage with the rumination. That's a mindfulness skill. So uh, we've started piloting this uh, over the last year, year or so in the lab. And the first study was an fMRI study where we tried to inhibit the posterior cingulate cortex with ultrasound. We did baseline resting state fMRI. We took people out of the scanner, put them back in. And the basic finding is that we saw a massive decrease in both um, precuneus and posterior cingulate activity when we're looking at the network connectivity of the posterior cingulate to other brain regions. So this is brain network connectivity. Now, what was really interesting about this, um, and I'll say this was 10 minutes of ultrasound, so this was a bigger dose that I've given, uh, talk, that I was talking about in the past. Now, when we asked participants, what was this like for you, um, three-fourths of the participants enjoyed this experience immensely. They said things that you would expect if you're down-regulating the default mode network. Um, they said that the crosshair, the thing that they were staring at in the scanner, was very easy to pay attention to. Uh, some people claim they sort of merged with it in a sense. You know, they just sort of got out into the visual world. And then when we gave them mindfulness skills, uh, most of them reported an increase in what we call decentering, which is essentially a measure of uh, being sort of emotionally detached. Now, detached doesn't mean a negative thing. It just means that if they were getting uncomfortable in the scanner, which most of them were, that that was okay. They didn't really get sort of triggered by that. They just sort of watched their discomfort and they let it happen that then tends to lead to them feeling okay about that experience. So that's pretty good evidence, uh, at least from the self-report here, that we were actually pushing people in a direction 
that's related to a mindfulness skill, a skill like deep centering. So uh, then in another pilot study, we actually targeted uh, just in seven subjects, the medial prefrontal cortex, the other area in the default mode network. And this time we recorded concurrent EEG, electroencephalogram. So if the person is having an EEG on and they're left at rest, what you'll find is that alpha, which is 10 hertz EEG, will increase. So alpha seems to be a marker of default mode activation. And our hypothesis was transcranial focused ultrasound would decrease the alpha. That's exactly what we found. So purple is a decrease relative to baseline. Uh, you can see actually theta, alpha, and beta um, decreased, which was interesting. Um, and that was both during ultrasound and 20 minutes after. And then when we actually plot those EEGs onto the neocortex, uh, what you see is a massive change in the medial prefrontal cortex. Also in the PCC and the precuneus, these were significant differences relative to the baseline, um, as well as some temporal parietal junction changes as well in alpha. So these are all alpha changes. Then uh, when we zoom in and we look at the network connectivity, so now we're doing source estimation on the EEG. Uh, we did Granger causality to look at whether the network connectivity has changed. And indeed, what you see is if you see the PCC, you see a significant decrease in connectivity to the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, so again, it looks like by targeting the prefrontal node of the default mode network, with focused ultrasound, we could decrease network connectivity and alpha EEG, which is a marker um, of the default mode activation. Now, what's interesting about this study is that subjects reported no subjective change. So uh, they just said it didn't change my mood. None of the scales that we gave them actually changed as well. Um, so that's pretty good evidence that targeting the default mode network uh, seems to change both network connectivity and at least with the posterior portion, you can actually change mood and maybe some mindfulness-like state. Uh, now, I wanted to show you what this looks like. So this is actually Shenzhen. I'm targeting his basal ganglia here. And the advantage of ultrasound is that it can be focal. Uh, the disadvantage is that you have to target. So you have to use neuronavigation to actually target the ultrasound. And uh, what you see here is actually the ant neuro system. So we've been using that system for about three years and I find it uh, highly effective at targeting. Um, let's see, I'm going to show you the video of what this looks like. So uh, this is a lab here behind me. Um, this is my subject. I can't have a person in the lab because of COVID. So I've got this styrofoam helmet. And so basically, uh, we bring people in, we get their MRIs, their structural MRIs, and um, then we actually align the ultrasound transducer to their head. And so this is my transducer. You'll see actually it's filled with water. So I'm pushing on the little area here. That surface has been matched to the conductance of the skin um, because you have to sort of match the impedance to get the ultrasound through. And so that actually makes it comfortable for the subject. They can lay on this transducer in the MRI scanner. This is MRI compatible. Um, and uh, it's very comfortable to put it on the back of the head. And then what you see is that camera, the neuronavigation camera can actually see this part of the transducer and we've aligned it. So the camera knows exactly relative to this geometry where the center of the transducer is. Now I've got um, an averaged MRI feed it into the machine here. And once the camera sees the transducer, then you see the subject's brain. Uh, the orientation is flipped because I've got the transducer upside down. But importantly, what happens is I get guided in. So um, for us, the, the only really important factors here are, are the distance to the target. So I've got the posterior cingulate as my target. And then the actual angle of the transducer. So if I angle even a couple degrees off, I'm actually not going to target the posterior cingulate. I'll target a neighboring region. And so this guidance system is actually guiding me down to the target. Um, you can't see the crosshairs, but there's little crosshairs. And then once these colors turn green, which is hard for you to see, that's telling me I'm within a couple millimeters of my target and I'm within a couple um, degrees of an angle. And so we've actually built a whole head unit that actually holds this transducer on the head. 
And then we basically just target every angle by every angle until we get right down to where we want to be. Um, and that actually looks um, a little something like this. So here's our whole head units. We've got EEG on Shenzhen at the same time. And you can see the neural navigation system. Oh, sorry, I'm not showing you this. There you go. Um, so you can see the head unit here. We've got EEG on the head as well. And uh, you can see that this little device can actually angle at different angles such that we can get right down to the target. Um, so really it takes a system like that to be able to target. Um, okay, so just in summary, uh, transcranial focused ultrasound is an emerging neuromodulation method. Um, I didn't mean for is to be capital, but it is. Um, it's useful for brain mapping, and as we can focus the beam better through the skull, it'll be even a more powerful technology. And it may be useful as a clinical tool to treat both <clears throat> neurological and psychological disorders. And what's really exciting about that is Unlike TMS or even TDCS, transcranial ultrasound could be embedded uh, in a cap or even embedded under the skin pretty easily uh, to be a fully wearable um, and ubiquitous device. And these transducers can be manufactured to be very small um, and very easy to use. And so I think going forward, it's still going to be many years before we have any type of consumer-like devices. Um, but but there's several groups working on those. There's a company called Brain Sonics, for example, another one called Sonic Concepts uh, that Jamie Tyler is working with. They're actually coming out with consumer type devices that can focus the ultrasound down that ultimately, I think, uh, one day will be very useful clinical devices. And so in talking about scaling these technologies out so we can actually start reducing suffering, um, it's a very, very exciting technology. Um, and with that, I just want to thank all of my collaborators. Um, all of this research takes an enormous team. Uh, and really, when you're working with transcranial ultrasound, you need to have engineers and physicists on your team to really understand how the, the sort of acoustic properties are shaping through the skull. Um, so I want to thank everybody. And thank you for paying attention. <laughs>